Good evening. Uh, my name is Mark Guerin. I'm the director of the Institute of Politics, and we warmly welcome you to our fast forum series during the summer. These are times when the Institute of Politics is joining with our student leadership and colleagues at the Institute of Politics to provide important space, uh, greater understanding and conversations with those that are a part of this amazing period of time that we're living through. And tonight is no exception. And we're delighted to have Omar Jimenez, a CNN reporter, correspondent based in Chicago, join us. Last week, we were fortunate to have the mayor of St. Paul, uh, Melvin Carter, uh, for a fast forum, and Professor Cornell Brooks had a very thoughtful conver community conversation with our student leadership. But tonight, Omar brings his reporting and uh, certainly the experience that he had in uh, on the ground coverage of Minneapolis and the protests following the murder of, of Mr. Floyd. And certainly his the experience of on the ground coverage and the rest with his production crew uh, captured uh, the nation. So we're thrilled to welcome him, Omar, to the, to the forum. And we're very pleased that our student moderators will engage in conversation. Uh, so I am gonna, with pleasure, turn it over to Nadia Douglas and Eric Jemba, great student leaders at the Institute of Politics uh, for tonight's session. Thank you for joining us. Um, hi, good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Nadia Douglas. I am a rising sophomore, um, and I'm currently interning um, through the IOP's wonderful program this summer in the Dallas Mayor's office. Um, so I'm coming to everyone from Texas. And good evening, everyone. My name is Eric Jemba. I'm a rising senior at the college and current co-chair of the Fellows and Study Groups program at the Institute of Politics, zooming in from New Jersey today. We're gonna to begin tonight's conversation with two opening questions, one from myself and one from Nadia, before turning it over to our fellow students. So please use the raise your hand function uh, in Zoom to indicate that you have a question. Now, shifting over to tonight's guest, Omar Jimenez. Omar is a CNN correspondent based in Chicago, and in addition to his coverage of the unrest following the murder of George Floyd, he's also covered the trials for the officers charged in the death of Freddie Gray, the 2019 wildfires in California, and the death of NBA legend Kobe Bryant. Please join me in welcoming Omar Jimenez. Omar, it's great to be with you. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. So I wanna start off with our first question here. Um, and I wanna go back to the, the moments leading up to your arrest on the ground in Minneapolis. In those moments, I see you keeping composed. I see you identifying yourself as a member of the media. Uh, and I see you even asking the officers on the ground where you could relocate to to finish your reporting. I see you responding the way that as young black men and as young Latino men in this country, we are trained at a very young age to respond uh, when confronted by authorities. I also can't help but see your arrest as part of this larger narrative and this growing trend in America right now, namely the undermining of the free press. So how do you reflect on the events that took place, both the very personal element of your arrest, but also how it inherently is this national symbol as well? Um, and how do you bring those two elements together in your analysis of what happened? Well, there are two sides to, to, to what happened in two lenses, I think, is, how, is the best way to describe it on how I've reflected on it. So the one is the community aspect of things, what, kind of what you talked, in, uh, talked about in your question, Eric, about what the conversations you have in, in a Black family about how to deal with police when you're pulled over by the police when you get your driver's license. You know, those are the things that all come through your head. How to, how to act, to be compliant, to make it out of that interaction alive. Like that is, your, that is your priority to just do what they say. So in that moment, I think you saw some of the manifestation of that unconsciously. Obviously, that wasn't the first thought in my head. But I was trying to do exactly what they said because, look, they're the police. I, I, I have seen, for better or, or for worse, what they are capable of. And I wanted to make sure that they did their job and I would do mine. So that's one set of concerns. But then also there's a journalistic set of concerns, right? Where I am doing my job as a member of the free press, as protected in the First Amendment of the United States and this, and this constitution. And we had been reporting on the streets of Minneapolis for days at that point and not destroying anything, not doing anything, literally doing our jobs the same way that police were doing theirs, showing what was happening in the city in one of the most consequential times in our history, not just in Minneapolis, but in the US. So 
that symbol of me in cuffs, again, for, for better or for worse in the long term, but that symbol of me in cuffs being led away and my microphone being handed off to my producer and all of a sudden that window that you just had into what was happening in Minneapolis was now closed for a, what I believe and I think we could have seen was a wrongful arrest in that moment is a, is a chilling image that shudders not just throughout the United States, but in places across the world. Because what I came back out and did my job, but the idea and, and the possibility and the image of being arrested for trying to tell that story can be an intimidating factor for a lot of people, again, who are trying to tell that same story. That's right. That's awesome. It was, it was especially, um, I think, for, uh, for some of us, um, uh, in background and context, I'm off, I'm also Afro Latina, and to see, I guess, like how you uh, maintain yourself throughout that situation, um, was really, um, I think, inspiring and motivating for me, um, to realize that not only does this, this is bias, like, do, do these biases or do these ideas and thoughts like permeate, no matter like where you are, um, in this country, uh, but it also showed me that you can rise above, um, and at the end of the day, try to accomplish your job and the duty that you have um, to the people you are serving. So I do thank you for the way you navigated that situation. Um, I would also like to ask, um, in terms of your role in the media and um, being someone, being a person of color in the media, um, I just wanted to bring up that some folks from various perspectives have felt that media outlets have recently hyper-focused on the violence, the anger, and the pain being demonstrated through protests of various forms. Um, so how do you, as an Afro-Latino, feel the media is doing in terms of the coverage? Um, and do you feel that it's fair and thorough, or is it over-sensationalized? I would say overall, it's fair and thorough. Now, is there sensationalism that we have seen out there? 100%. But I think where, where at least I and, and the people that I work with have tried to draw the line comes from proper framing and perspective. So if we show buildings on fire and people rioting in the streets, we can't not show that. You have to show like, like that is happening in Minneapolis. But where the media's responsibility comes in and what we really tried to, to focus in on was, okay, let's, let's analyze the dynamics of why this is happening. Sure, as we understand from some protesters, from some locals, and even from police and investigators on the scene, there is a population of outside people that would come in and instigate and literally try to burn down some places. But then there were also well-meaning and well-intentioned protesters who said and told us specifically, look, we have tried to get people's attention in other ways. We have tried to kneel before football games. We have tried to march in the streets and nothing has changed, this is now our only voice that seems to get people's attention. And so I think that was at least what our crew in Minneapolis really tried to hone in on as we compare it with the, because this is the perfect example, the cycle every day was peaceful protests during the day of you know music and people marching to the streets. Then there would be the curfew or the sun would go down and some of those peaceful protests would morph into something else, many times more violent. And again, while there was, I would say, you know, a small population of people that were either coming from out of town or trying to instigate, a lot of those people felt that, look, this is all we got. This is our moment. We have to take advantage of this. If we're not heard now, we'll never get heard. So to answer your question, if you just present the images of buildings on fire and rioting, again, which are accurate because it's happening, but if you just do that as wallpaper video, I think that's where you start to get a little irresponsible. I think you need some of that framing and perspective of being a journalist to lay that out for the audience of why that is happening and, and uh, why, why this moment is different. Great, thank you for that, Omar. I, I agree yeah. completely. I think that framing element is crucial to responsible reporting and I appreciate your insights on that. I wanna go ahead and shift now to our audience. Um, some of our students have some questions lined up and our first question today comes from Ara Omatoa. She's the Director of Diversity and Outreach at the Institute of Politics. Hey. Hi, Omar. Thank you so much for speaking with us today, just about your experiences, especially from an authentic standpoint as a person of color in the media. Um, I could speak from personal experience, and this has been a very difficult time just in terms of like being Black in America once again. And now that we're taking off the band aid of like social propriety to talk about racism from a real standpoint, 
it's yeah. been a very exhausting time for a lot of people, including myself and my friends and my family. And so I'm just wondering as you who is very like in the middle of it from Freddie Gray to Minneapolis, even Kobe Bryant, like a lot of traumatic events have happened this year. So I'm just wondering what have been ways, small ways that you've been able to take care of yourself? Oh, how I've been able to take care of myself? Well, uh, I'm glad you brought this up. I actually had a conversation uh, with some other coworkers about this um, on Friday because it has been an insane year. I mean, from January 1, 2020, when all of us probably made the New Year's resolution that this was going to be our year, it has been a crazy year. And so uh, one of the easiest ways or the best ways that I fall back on are, are my friend networks and my, my, my family. So, I mean, crucially, I have felt that throughout all of this, I need to have people who don't do what I do, who aren't consumed by what I, but by the news and, and the awfulness that we sometimes see in it, so that I can get my mind off things. I can go talk to them about basketball. We can go play Call of Duty and drop up on Warzone and forget about the world for at least one, two, maybe three hours, depending on the, the night or weekend afternoon. Um, and so it's always things like that that I very, very much look forward to. And I, oh, I prioritize that time almost as much as work time. When people ask me to do an extra assignment, if I'm going a certain stretch of days in a row, I might make up an excuse that's maybe a little bit more significant than the actual excuse really is, just to make sure that I actually have that time to sort of reset a little bit. Because you can't live this job every single day. I think the the main thing that I heard from one of my journalism mentors a while ago, but then I've actually lived, is in a lot of these scenarios, you are parachuting into these people's worst days of their lives, time in and time again. And hopefully, that is the one time those people ever experience it. But for you, once you experience those worst day of people's lives, time in and time in and time again, it's impossible not to take some of that back home with you unless you are finding a way to release, unless you're turning off your phone, putting it on do not disturb and, you know, grilling out with friends for a weekend. So in short, I prioritize my social aspect of my life almost as much, if not more sometimes than my professional obligations, but just because you have to, and it's better, it's going to be better for me in the long run. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, I believe our next question is coming from uh, Victor Flores, um, a, a prominent IOP figure um, and rising sophomore in the college. <laughs> prominent figure, no, no, no pressure, <laughs> Victor. No, I, I wouldn't say that. Um, but hello, and thank you so much for being here. Um, now, my question is: seeing that the current administration is seeing that the current administration is purposefully using um, certain media outlets as divisive figures rather than um, what is maybe their initial purpose of being news. Uh, my question is: what kind of conversations do you have you been in in discussing what is um, what you see the role of media being in this time of great polarization? Um, like, is, what kind of conversations, do you, is, is this an issue that you guys are discussing? Um, how do you see the role of media should be in combating um, the, the device of rhetoric? Yeah, no, these are conversations we have all the time. And I think, I think the big wake up call for a lot of organizations came in part from the 2016 election, right? There was a big sort of, all right, there was a lot of, there were a lot of things that were very unprecedented that happened over course of that and then the run leading up to that and then afterwards there was sort of the analysis phase what went right what went wrong and I would say we're still we've always been continually learning but specifically from that point you start to realize and look at all right well what how do we balance the what the audience needs to know with potentially furthering interests of a, of a political candidate or of something that may not be totally accurate. You know what I'm saying? So, so that's something that's continually evolving and it comes in different forms because it started with, okay, well, you know, to take the president, for example, we can't take his rallies live anymore because unless we're going to fact check every single line that, that he, that he says, that was a decision that you're starting to see a lot of media organizations go in the opposite direction. Some have leaned heavily into it, but I can tell you for our purposes, that's not what we do. 
So that's one approach. But then you come down to, well, let's take this pandemic, for example, where every day we were supposed to have the coronavirus task force briefings that were initially led by, you know, Dr. Fauci and, uh, and uh, Dr. Deborah Burks and members of the medical staff in, involved in that task force. Well, then slowly it began being taken over by the political figures uh, like, like the president and like Vice President Mike Pence. And so now we're starting to have conversations of, okay, well, what is the value uh, to our audience of letting this play out, unless we're fact-checking it or unless we're, we have a desire to fact-check it, what is the value of letting it play out live when potentially lives could could be at stake and and we would in some ways bear responsibility for letting that go out unfiltered so in short to answer your question these are conversations that are happening all the time i wish there was just one clean answer of like boom that's it we solved it but also he is the president of the united states so there is an inherent value to to getting his perspective and hearing it we just have to be more conscious, I think, than ever as media organizations as to what is accurate if we present it to frame it in a way that, again, is helpful to our audience whenever possible, and then try to, uh, again, try to draw that line of what is valuable versus what is just overtly furthering this person's interests. If that helps. Great. The prominent Thank figure. Thank you for <laughs> yes. <laughs> so our next question comes from Hannah Kairos. She's a rising junior at the college from Tallahassee, Florida. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi. It's uh, really incredible to speak with you. Um, I was explaining to like my nine-year-old cousins what was happening on the TV as you got arrested, and it was like a a big learning moment for them about like race in America. Um, I wanted I wanted to talk to you about um, how your work with the Chicago Innocence Project. Um, impacted your career trajectory and how you do journalism, um, just because I know I, that that's an organization that I deeply admire. And I wonder if, you know, learning about criminal justice through that work influenced the way that you've been reporting. Yeah. So my work with the Chicago Innocence Project, for those that don't know, um, when I was a uh, senior in college, um, I, I worked with them basically for, for a fall quarter at, at Northwestern. Um, working to help investigate potential wrongful convictions. And so that work was unbelievably valuable for me at the time, because I think leading up to that moment, I mean, I obviously was doing video journalism stuff at Northwestern and, you know, you, you'd done some community stories and things like that. But I think up until that point, I hadn't truly seen firsthand the impact, the real world impact that journalism can have on people's lives. So I start working with this group and they're showing me these stories about how specific work that they had done had led to the release of someone who was wrongfully convicted for, for decades. And that was one of the people we worked with. His name is it was Stanley Rice. And, um, and just to hear his perspective about how thankful he was that when the police investigators went away, and in some ways they were the ones, crooked ones were the reasons he ended up there. But when the sort of uh, law enforcement or investigative people went away, that there were journalists that were, came in there and, and saved his life, literally getting him out of prison. Um, that had a real impact on just, again, the real impact that journalism can have. But then also, I think sometimes we get lost as reporters in, in the numbers of, oh, yeah, this person was arrested for 20 years. But you don't realize how long that actually is until when he got out, he didn't know how to put on a seatbelt. Because when he went into prison, seatbelts weren't required in cars, you know? And so it, it reminds me that there's always a human side on the other side of the numbers. And I think I've been able to apply that to, like, whether it's arrest, talking about number of years, or the number of people shot in a, in a scene, if we're unfortunately covering a mass shooting or anything like that. There's a human angle to it that I think sometimes get, gets lost in the numbers. Because Chicago Innocence Project is not a huge organization that you see every single day. It's not a glamorous job. A lot of the work that we were doing was looking at old court documents, looking at whether witnesses were spoken to. Um, and the last thing I'll say just from a practical standpoint on this is there was a real sensitivity in approaching who we spoke to in this because there were a lot of emotions drawn up in it. And I remember we went to this one, um, this one woman's house 
who knew one of the witnesses from a while ago on, on a case that we were working on. And when we knocked on the door, we got yelled off the porch. Like the name hadn't been brought up to her in years, but we got yelled out. I, I don't think that's ever happened to me. Like we sprinted back to the car and, um, and the advice I was given was to write down our information um, and a little card and just put it under the welcome mat and then leave. And sure enough, we got a call because she said, look, I'm so sorry I reacted that way. I just hadn't heard that name in so long. It brought up a lot of emotions. What do you want to know? So there were, it had a huge impact on me. And um, I encourage anyone to, to at least for uh, at least a, a set amount of time to, to do similar type work because it will change you. Thank you so much. Yeah. That's awesome. I really like the fact that you, you um, are able to take those other experiences into journalism because I feel like oftentimes today um, the human aspect can get lost in, um, in, I guess, the work itself and the information coming out. So thank you for making that a priority. Um, our next question comes from a rising junior in the college named Noah Harris. Uh, Noah, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and uh, ask your question. Um, don't know what happened to Noah. Um, so if he comes back. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm being told he got kicked out of the call. Um, we will bring him back. Whenever he gets back in, we'll ask his question. Um, following Noah, I think, is uh, Jasmine, I believe. Jasmine, hello. <laughs> <laughs> nothing from Noah, nothing from Jasmine. I guess in the meantime, I'll, I'll butt in with another question of mine that I yeah, had, which sure. kind of relates oh. back to you know, oh, how you translated. Oh, oh, there's Jasmine. <laughs> I'll save mine. Jasmine, you're Go up. ahead, Eric. No, you go ahead while I fix this. It'll okay. Work. Relating I can hear back you. to uh, <laughs> relating back to this idea of some of the lessons you're able to bring out of your work with Chicago Innocence into journalism. You know, there are a lot of students on the call uh, today who are interested in journalism specifically as a potential career. So I'm interested yep. to know, you know, what advice you found kind of most helpful in your journey to where you are at in your career today that you might be willing to share with students on the call interested in following a similar path. Well, I mean, at the very least, like diversify because I'm in, I'm in TV right now. And I think I would have done a disservice to myself if I had just done a bunch of TV internships in a row. I think, especially when you're a student, look at what you've done and try to do something different. Because when you get out, you want to be the most complete person you can possibly be. So, um, you know, I worked in local for a little bit um, before I got out of school at a local station in small town, Quincy, Illinois. It's a wonderful place. And then I also did, did internships for some of the big networks at NBC and at CNN. And then I worked with the Chicago Innocence Project. Nothing to do with TV, but what that taught me, like, again, from a practical standpoint, was about how to chase documents and how to be a little bit more sensitivity to the realness, again, of the people behind the numbers. And uh, more so, again, the research and investigative side of things that obviously I've ended up using in my, in my normal job every day. And by the way, even with that arsenal, I still, there's still other gaps that I could have tried to fill over the course of college that, you know, I'm now working with at the moment, like on my job, trying to get better every day still. So that's my overarching advice. Try to try to cast as wide a net as possible while you're in school and while you don't have to risk rent in the real world to find what you're good at, um, find something that can enhance your resume and make you better as a reporter so that you don't have to do as much legwork on the back end if you're, if you're putting it on the front end. Awesome. I think that's now? helpful for any career, really. That's helpful. For sure. For sure. All right. Awesome. Well, we have Noah back. So Noah's a rising junior in the college. And Noah, go go for it. Yes. Uh, sorry. I had some uh, technical difficulties. But um, but thank you. Thank you for joining us. And um, I want to focus on your, your rest as well. Um, I know mm -hmm. you weren't asking for your coverage to be thrown into this 
this national uh, tab for us um, as we are advocating for police reform and for change in, in our communities with, with, um, with how policing is, um, is done in our communities. Um, so I was wondering, do you believe that police reforms like uh, racial bias training or, or other reforms like that are enough? Or um, do you think that other reforms are necessary? I was kind of wondering um, what you think would have been the most effective reform to prevent um, your situation? Well, that's it's a tough question for my specific situation as far as what would have prevented it because there are a million different theories I have as to why this happened, but Minnesota State Police never explained to me. I only got an explanation from the governor who apologized for what happened, but state police, all they did was put out a tweet that was inaccurate saying that, oh, we were trying to verify that they were reporters. So that's the only explanation I got from them. But as far as long-term reform and what could actually make a difference, look, we've had, there's been racial bias training on the books for a while in a lot of these places, you know? Um, so I don't know that, I don't know that honing in on that is going to make a significant impact. I think what is interesting to me is, um, I mean, it's become a buzz phrase at this point, um, is about like defund the police that we have seen the movement in places across the country, um, about trying to redirect funds from the police department into other places of the community to kind of stop things on the front end before, you know, you're trying to deal with it on the back end. I, I would say that's the most interesting space to watch for me. Um, only because in a lot of the conversations, or I should say every conversation I've had in stories of violence or of crime or interactions with police I've covered in Baltimore or here in Chicago, everybody always says crime is a multifaceted issue. You, you can't fix it by just throwing money at police. You can't fix it by just throwing money at education. You have to, it has to be a whole picture in regards to your approach to fixing it. So in regards to Again, your question about what long-term police reform could look like and what it could and what could work, I think that is the most interesting space to pay attention to for me because I can't remember a last time where there's been such a push to take money away from the police department and redirect it into other places. Even in Minneapolis, for example, the city council president Lisa Bender, um, back when Minneapolis was passing their city budget. Um, at the end of 2019, I remember I was doing a story on the budget because they wanted to add police officers. I think the push was to add uh, around 14 additional police officers or so, but don't quote me on that. They just wanted to add, add new police officers. And Lisa Bender at the time was saying, whoa, 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 well, I don't think we should add police officers. I think we should invest in other places within the community. And that I remember at the time wasn't viewed with as much enthusiasm as fast forward a few months later, she's still a city council president in Minneapolis. She puts forward a similar idea and boom, now everybody is with her. Now they're cutting ties with Minnesota Park Police and with schools, uh, with schools as well. And so I think have, seeing the momentum that that movement has had in cities across the country could be something that could make a long, uh, long term change because I don't think it's been done so far at least in an organized movement. And I don't think we've, again, seen what the results could possibly be. So if you do something different on the front end, hopefully something different comes out on the back end, but your guess is as good as mine as for what will surely work right now. Awesome. Yeah, it is, I think you alluded to earlier, it being a real flashpoint moment in the country. And I think people are starting to look very critically about you know systems of the past and just kind of trying to reimagine new ways of doing some old things too. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. So our final question is going to come from Jasmine, Jasmine Hippolyte, mm -hmm. who is back. She is the vice president of the Institute of Politics. Oh. Hi. <laughs> no stress. Hi. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here and speaking with us. Um, I think one question I've been thinking of is. Um, how do we really define the role of advocacy here and where does it come into the media? I think we mostly understand the media as describing what's happening at the moment, what has happened, and what we predict what will happen. But how and where do we uplift the voices of people who are trying to advocate for certain issues 
and have that on television, for example, like where where do we draw the line um, and how do we ensure that all voices are, are being heard? There are different demographics, obviously, for people who watch TV and watch the news versus people who inform themselves on Twitter, on Instagram and things. So I think it is important that we have advocacy for whatever you believe on all of those platforms, but um, sometimes I don't really feel like it's there. Um, so I'm wondering what your perspective is on that and where um, advocates for certain issues really fall into reporting and news um, and big, big, um, I guess, reporting companies. So this is where it's a really good question and it only gets highlighted sadly in stories like this, like the George Floyd story, like with the Richard Brooks and on and on and on, sadly. Um, so let's start with the role of, uh, of a journalist, of a reporter. So typically, the, the definition is you have to be, you know, an objective reporter and, you know, non-biased. You get both of the facts and you present what's out there, which is still, still holds true. And, and it still will for, for as long as, um, as long as time goes on. But the difference that I think we're starting to see in stories like this is that it's okay to, to draw on your personal experience within a community to inform some of that reporting and, per, and to provide perspective. So when you talk about the advocacy aspect of this, even if you can't say on air, oh, Black Lives Matter or defund the police, I think there is a part of your experience that tells you that having that perspective is important in your stories. So if you're going to go do a story on George Floyd and you talk to the police and you talk to the mayor's office and you talk to sort of the typical official voices you would in a story, they're the personal experience of what you consume on social media or what your family is telling you or what your friends talk about should tell you, well, you know what, I, an important voice in the story would be the defund the police people or the Black Lives Matter people who have been out there protesting because that's a voice that is clearly significant and matters in this moment. And I think, depend, and this is why I think diversity in newsrooms and, and, uh, and workplaces are so important because priorities and what people view as important shifts based on how you were brought up and based on your background. And even if, let's just say, for example, a white reporter was tasked with, with the same deal. Not to say that they couldn't have the same mentality of, you know, let's, let's include these advocacy groups and these protesters and whatever, but even if they do the same story and the story isn't wrong, you know, talking to the police, talking to the mayor's office or the governor's office, there's an argument to be made that maybe it's not as complete without that added perspective. Um, and I think that's sort of the space that we play in as reporters. There probably is some a better overarching answer for like organizations and what we should do. But as far as me functioning in my space, I try to incorporate my personal experiences to inform what I do, to paint a more complete picture and not just focus so uptightly so on painting an accurate picture. Accuracy still can come in complete, but complete doesn't always, you know, exclusively include accurate, you know? Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. That's great. Both Nadia and I had the pleasure uh, earlier this semester before we got kicked off of campus to uh, be in a study group with Tiffany Cross, who was one of our resident fellows. And she made that similar point you mentioned about diversity in newsrooms and really diversity in all industries when it comes to decision making and just the crucial importance of that to the outcomes that we're all trying to work towards. So I appreciate that. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you very much for this conversation tonight. I know that you have been through a lot these last few weeks. And so we really do appreciate you taking the time to chat with us. I'm glad to hear that you're doing well, mixing in some war zone and keeping things light. So <laughs> glad to hear that. Yeah, I'm gonna go to war zone tonight probably. So if my friends are watching, I'll, I'll be on like 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Well, a thank you from both Nadia and myself and I'm sure all the students uh, who had a chance to tune in tonight. Um, and a thanks to everyone for, for just tuning in and we hope to see everyone at future FAST forums uh, later on this week. Thanks for having me. Of course.